Melina and Roland made some very important points in their 1975 paper, the main one being that the lifetime of the chlorofluorocarbons is extremely long, 50 to 100 years. There's no way to destroy these gases. Once you put them in, they've got nowhere to go except up to the ozone layer where they're going to destroy it. The ozone is a protective layer that, that absorbs the very energetic radiation and, and the chlorofluorocarbons won't break up until they get above most of that. And so it's not, it's not accidental that the CFCs are tied in with the ozone layer. Uh, they are protected until they get up to an altitude of uh, 9 or 10 miles before you start seeing uh, the effects of the reaction with solar ultraviolet radiation. Experts in the field, atmospheric scientists, atmospheric chemists, in general, accepted it as something uh, plausible, something that was likely to happen. Our goal at some point became to, to actually communicate these findings to society with the hope that something uh, could be done. It was hard to communicate to people that something that they couldn't feel, couldn't taste, couldn't see, uh, didn't cause any obvious respiratory problems was in fact a serious threat in the form of uh, of long-term exposure leading to an increased risk of cancer. A problem that, uh, had it been allowed to languish and grow, would have created more health problems. Soon after I arrived in NASA, I was asked to sort of take over the management of a US-led assessment of ozone depletion. It was mandated by Congress that every two years, NASA had to write a state of the ozone layer. What seemed logical to me is if we're going to negotiate an international treaty on stratospheric ozone depletion, there needed to be one uh, international assessment where the scientists around the world spoke with one voice. And so during that period, 1980, 1985, I worked with the scientific community to get together a true international assessment that could be the, the basis for informed international negotiations. You know, as I look back on what we did in implementing the Montreal Protocol, I think it is probably one of the most successful cooperative efforts that I have ever seen between, in this case, a regulatory agency, the EPA, a regulated agency, the Department of Defense, the NGOs, their suppliers, and their counterparts in other countries. And the fact of the matter is, it worked. It was incredibly successful. Suddenly there was a paper by Joe Farman who had a Dobson instrument located in Antarctica at Halley Bay that suggested that in the springtime, August, September, October period, there was a sudden depletion of ozone. A series of international experiments was done. The biggest one was in 1987, where there were some ground-based observations, two very well-equipped aircraft, a uh, DC-8 and an ER-2, and some satellite observations. And it became very, very clear, very quickly, we humans were having a direct effect that was unambiguous on the ozone layer. I have to say it was tremendously exciting to go to Antarctica. You know, you, you realize when you're there how incredibly remote and beautiful and uh, untouched the place is. And it's so ironic to sit there and watch the ozone layer disappear. Well, I think the key development in industry was when the DuPont Company, which was the major U.S. manufacturer of chlorofluorocarbons, an $800 million revenue item, by the way, for them, when they concluded that the scientists were right. The Montreal Protocol was signed in September of 1987. It was shortly after that that uh, the results of the Antarctic aircraft expedition came out and the decision was made on Friday afternoon, three days after the release of the report, that uh, we would commit to a total phase out of CFCs. It was the first time I had ever seen companies come together on something that if they withheld information and kept it proprietary, it would give them a competitive advantage. I think the number one lesson is you have to have really good science. It has to be done extremely carefully. It has to be verified by multiple sets of observations and by multiple different uh, models. We need to have coordinated research globally and international assessments so that the scientific community talks with one voice to the international negotiators. Because of the spirit of cooperation with the government setting standards that were 
challenging yet flexible, allowed industry to innovate, industry came forward, and uh, everyone worked together to make this happen. I think the, um, the intersection of science and public policy is a lesson there. Science really drove that. Science is what made me confident that the public policy position I was advocating was sound, was supportable, was going to be important to the future. We have a substantial scientific establishment, and uh, they were right on this issue, it turns out, and when it was just a hypothesis. Later it was all confirmed. And um, I think the same is true on climate change. Now we were, we're getting not just computer models, but observations. So there's every reason to follow the same course, listen to the same scientific opinion.